Geraldine, or rather good morning for you. Thank you so much for <laughs> taking the time out. Actually, you know, from India to East Coast, Geraldine, if I remember right now, you're in the East Coast. There's a huge time difference, but over the last decade or so of knowing each other, I always felt that we are so connected. The distance or the time never felt very large. So thank you so much for taking the time out and being a part of the 100 Women of Impact. I just have one question to ask you. And this is basically to say that you actually graduated, you did your undergrad studies in history. and Art then you, history. Art history. And then of course, uh, you went on to also do some uh, courses in the teaching side. Um, while you were in an industry which was ultimately catering to the younger audience, the children. But what was that journey like from an under, because a lot of our students, they say that we are doing engineering, we are doing this, we are doing that, but they ultimately land up in say something completely different in their careers. Do you think that there is some kind of a connection of what you learned over there to what you did eventually? Absolutely. I mean, the thing about a liberal arts education is that they teach you to question everything. And so, you know, I, I studied English and art history and politics. And when I left Vassar, I thought I was going to be a city planner architect. And um, I, that's become my hobby. And I do that. But what it really taught me was I had this privilege of such a good education. And all of us felt like we had to do something important. And when I was at Vassar, they listened hard to students. And we were in a transition time where we went from being a single uh, sex college, a girls school, one of the first, the first. And um, we went to being a co-educational uh, organization. And I was one of, I was the only woman, only, female student who was put on the master planning committee and they put a guy who was from Williams on the master planning committee but that taught me more about change and listening and um how do you pull out of a conversation the great ideas and I think you know in some ways that's the blessing of Vassar was we questioned everything, but in order to get the good stuff to come up. And uh, I find that smart people, when they're in a room and somebody proposes something, the first inclination is to spout off what's wrong about something. And that is so easy. And the brilliant people figure out what's right about. It. And so, you know, Vassar taught me that. This is such an interesting from art history to learning the leadership skills, learning to listen. The art of listening can't be, I would say, uh, you know, it's one of the most important skill or competency which any leader can have. But more importantly is to say in any situation or any kind of a suggestion to figure out what's working right or what could work right. And that having that eternal optimism of a situation is something which keeps you steady. My question to you is that you did your education, you did your master's in education, you did your undergrad in art history, and then you landed up in ecology. What was that which triggered? I mean, if you could explain, how did you land up in ecology or how did it start the whole process? Well, I, I started first by having a research organization and we, we were doing research on kids and education and trying to find films that would be a turn-on agent for classrooms. So they, they were very way out films. Film is art, independent filmmaking. And um, what I learned in that process was kids had a wide acceptance of lots of different things. It was television that was dumbing down everything for kids. At that to start a small company called Early Bird Specials with a grant from Thomas Watson from IBM to my partner, Eli Noyes, who was an animator. And we marketed the work of independent filmmakers to television. And the first thing, our first client was Nickelodeon before it was even on the air. And we, they ended up hiring me and event, you know, we hired Eli over time. 
but it was um, such an exciting time because there was nothing, there was nothing that was worthwhile on Nickelodeon. And I got hired. And by the time I left, we had 56% of all kids, kid TV viewing. 96% of all kids felt we understood them. We were the highest rated cable network in America, probably in the world. And, you know, you cannot think too big. You have to be persistent. And, you know, as people tell you how naive you are, you just smile and say, yep, I just, it's, I'm so naive. I built a $12 billion business. You know, my next question to you, Geraldine, is that um, people always say media industry specifically is not so uh, right place for women to thrive because of whatever reasons. Um, but you have been a kind of an icon in the media industry. Can you share one, maybe one example or one thing where you felt um, that this is not a right fit or you felt challenged um, in the media industry being a woman over there? Well, I was um, incredibly lucky that um, a woman who was 20 years older than me, who had been in the broadcast industry, a wonderful person named Bernice Coe, had figured out that she was going to help women. So she made the introduction for me at Nickelodeon. And she told me, the broadcast industry has been terrible for women. You and I are going to change it. We're going to make it, we're going to make cable a good place for women. And so she would call me up and say, I'd like you to interview Ann Sweeney. And I'd interview Ann Sweeney and hire her. Lisa Judson interview hire. Anne went on to be have a bigger job than I ever had at ABC Disney. She was in charge of all television, broadcast, and cable. And you know what could be better than that? And when I left, twenty women were presidents of cable networks because we formed a club that was like the the secret power chicks club. The important thing is never let your ideas be stolen because women somehow have this idea that they're supposed to be um, peacemakers and, you know, collaborative and, you know, accommodating. Being peacemakers and accommodate and and collaborating is fine, but accommodating is not. And we kid ourselves if we think we're going to keep our jobs by being nice. We keep our jobs by having ideas. Geraldine, this is so fantastic to build a group of allies as well as build a group of super awesome women friends around you who are your colleagues, who are your industry partners, who are your networks, and celebrate each other's success. My next question is, um, what is that one something which you wish you had known in your career when you were starting your career? What is that one thing which you wish you had known when you were starting your career? I would say that money is not the hardest part. And I always thought it was. But having a persistent vision and having success is a great ticket to being able to raise other money. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I had, there was a time when I might have been able to organize to buy Nickelodeon out of, um, we had so many different corporate structures. and. I could see the possibilities for Nickelodeon, but most of the corporation thought it was just a nice thing to have to help cable operators get franchises. And I think if I had had more confidence about just trying to raise money, we might have been able to do a management buyout. Interesting because I always feel women entrepreneurs, and this is why. I 
I was having this discussion. I sit on one of the VC board, on a venture capital firm board. And one of the discussion was that why there are so many less women-led startups being funded by VCs. And it's, it's a two-way street. Of course, VCs are to be blamed that they are not out there looking for these women-led startups or they don't have the confidence. And the other way street is that women are not so prepared to make that big ask. And sometimes they need to be prepped and pitched, mentored and guided to make that ask. Um, I always have seen when I was mentoring and coaching women as well, that they're always afraid to stick the neck out and ask what's their worth. Whether it's in a job negotiation salary, whether it's in a raise, whether it's in a promotion or whether it's a fund for their own company. I, I, I have myself faced this. It's an imposter syndrome. And I see a lot many women, very, very smart kick-ass women around me also facing this challenge. Of course, the younger generation is far more confident, I feel. Um, but yes, it's still a long way to go. Well, I think, you know, I'm very excited about the younger generation because they um, they have had a completely different experience and they have a great sense of social justice and I think that a lot of things they've seen are pretty unattractive. And so they're, my hope is that they will keep their eye on sociological needs. Like, I would say. One, one thing for me is like when we were doing Nickelodeon, I was reading everything I could from psychologists and sociologists about kids and what was happening. And you kind of have to marinate and see your consumers and be with your consumers. One last question for my audience. Um, what is that one advice or a mantra you would give to all the women out there, the girls who are the young girls, as well as the women entrepreneurs, as well as the women corporate professionals, one top advice which you would give to all of them? I would say that friends are really important, male and female friends, and having the ability to find something to like about people is really key. And a stumbling block for many women is they can't get comfortable with their male bosses or even female bosses, or they can't get comfortable with authority figures. But being playful and friendly, this the truth is, and this is true for me, I like people, I like to work with people who like to work with me. Crazy. But for I all think of us. especially young women, because you know, there, there are dangers for young women in being playful. Um I was always fortunate because I got married really young and I had kids really young and I was had this protective shield around me. But I just think that genuinely liking people is a key to success. I, I always think that you spend so much of time in your workplace. You spend more waking hours in a week or in a year in your workplace than you actually spend with your partner at home or anybody. You might get married to your partner, but Honestly, the maximum amount of time you spend is with your colleagues, your industry partners, your clients, your supporters, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I always believe that if, if that part of your life is not fun, and if you're not liking it, it starts building up in your psyche, and you're not your 100% over there, and eventually you become a shadow of yourself. So this is such an important advice, liking what you do with who you do, and uh, how you do it. It's, it's, it's so important uh, on that front. Geraldine, that's, that's a wrap for us. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Again, it's, it's always such a huge learning experience whenever I interact with you. Thank you so much for joining us. I feel exactly the same way and anytime. Uh...